Okay, welcome to Operating Systems Preemptive CPU Scheduling Practice. So let's get started. We will be doing the calculations, so if you need to review, go back to the other videos to review what turnaround time, waiting time, response time, and CPU utilization are. In this case, we will have simple exercises, so the CPU utilization will be 100%. We will be doing the preemptive algorithms, round robin, shortest remaining time, which is shortest job first preemptive, and preemptive priority. So let's get started. Here's our first exercise. This is round robin, which is first come first serve, only instead of allowing the process to stay on the CPU to complete its entire burst, it will get five time units, which has been assigned to your time quantum of five, and in which case, after it finishes its five time units, it will then be preemptive and we'll have to go back, in, directly back into the ready queue. So let's get started. This is our Gantt chart, and we start at time zero, and since it's first come first serve, we will start with P1, which arrived first, and P1 does have a CPU first of eight, and so it will be given five time units on the CPU, and at time five, it will then be preempted and go back into the ready queue at time five, and we'll have three time units of CPU burst left. Now the current time is 5 and the next one to arrive is P2 and P2 happens to have a very short CPU burst less than the time quantum so therefore P2 will complete its execution and will be done at time 8. Now next up we the current time is 8 and the next one to arrive in the, if you look at the arrival times, is P3. And P3 has a CPU burst of 10, so it will go until time 13, and then it will be preempted and need to go back into the ready queue at time 13, and we'll have five time units left of CPU burst. And now the current time is 13, and this is where you need to be careful because P1 actually arrived in the ready queue before P4. So you might think, oh, I want to use P4, but P1, because it, it got there at time 5, that is an earlier arrival time than P4. So therefore, the next to go is going to be P1. So P1 will go next, and P1 has three time units of CPU burst, and so at time 16, P1 will be done. Okay, now the current time is 16. And in the ready queue, we have P3, P4, and P5. And P4 got there at time 6. So P4 is going to go next until time 21. And then P4 will have a new arrival time of 21. Oops, that one's done. And we'll have four time units of CPU burst left. Now the current time is 21. So the next one to arrive in the ready queue was P5, and P5 will get five time units until time 26. We'll have a new arrival time of 26. I hope you can see that enough. And now the current time is 26, and we have P3, P4, and P5. So now it's pretty simple to just run them in that order. So we would have P3 got there at time 13 and has five time units left, P4 has four time units left, and P5 has two time units left. So the total time it took to complete these processes was 37 time units, and since we have 100% CPU utilization, then we uh, have the, we all, if you add up all the CPU bursts, then that should equal to 37 which I, I checked and it does. Okay, so now we need to do the calculation. So let's start with the response time. So the response time is a one-time measure from the first time they arrive to the first time they get on the CPU. And the response time is also the first measure of wait time. So P1 had arrived at time zero, first got on there at time zero, so P1's response time is zero. Let's do all of P1 and then all of P2. Then to do the turnaround time, you take the last entry, which is right here, P1 finished at time 16, arrived at time zero, so P1's turnaround time is going to be 16. Now you can take the turnaround time and subtract the CPU burst time and you would get the wait time. So that means that P1 
was active in the system for 16 time units. Eight of those time units it was on the CPU and eight of those time units it was waiting. And the way to check that is just to check here. P1 waited zero time units here, but then P1 waited eight time units here. So keep in mind that the response time is, is a one-time measure and it's the first measure of the wait time. So let's check P2 now. P2 arrived at time three, got there on the CPU at time five, so response time was two. P2 was active in the system for a total of five time units. So the wait time is going to only be two time units. P3 uh, arrived at time four and finally got the CPU after uh, waiting four time units. So P3 to get here waited four time units. And then P3 got preempted and had to wait all this other time units, which was uh, then waited 13 more time units. So P3's wait time is going to be four time units plus the additional 13 time units. So P3 waited a total of 17 time units. The other way to get the wait time is just to say P3 finished all of its work. Its total time active in the system was 31 time units. It arrived at time four, so its turnaround time would be 27. And then if you take that 27 and you subtract, well, out of those 27 time units it was active in the system, 10 of those time units it was on the CPU, then 17 it was waiting. So then we have P4. P4 arrived at time six and got to the CPU the first time at time 10. And P4 finished at 35, so was active in the system for 29 time units and 20 of those time units P4 was waiting. And P5 arrived at time 11 and eventually got to the CPU at time 21, so waited 10 time units. Again, response time is a one-time measure. P5 finished at time 37, so the turnaround time is 26. And the total time that P1, P5 waited was the first 10 time units, and then P5 had to wait again nine more time units. So if you take these numbers and you add them up and divide by five, you will get the averages. So let's move on to the next exercise, which is shortest remaining time, or shortest job first preempted. So in this case, we we're gonna use five processes again, and we'll make our Gantt chart. And this you have to keep track of it, if a process is arriving and its CPU burst is shorter then the time that is left on the process that was just executing, then you're going, it's going to preempt. So let's get started. So at time zero, we start with P1. Now P1 has a CPU burst of eight time units. And what's going to happen is at time three, we're going to have the arrival of P2. And when P2 arrives, it's going to preempt P1 because at time three, P1 has a CPU burst of five, at time three, P1 has five time units left at, of its CPU burst, and P2 has only three time units of CPU burst. So P2 is uh, shorter, shorter remaining time. So P2 will go next, and P2 is the shortest one here, so it will not get preempted. So P2 will go until time six. And now the current time is six, so we uh, P2 is done, and we need, need to make a determination on who goes next. Well, at time six, in the ready queue, we have P1 that has a CPU burst of five, we have P3, which has a CPU burst of 10, and we have P4, which, is, which has a CPU burst of, of nine. So if after you do not have any, uh, you know, shorter, uh, shorter ones arriving, then it just goes and follows along as shortest job first. So we'll, we can see by looking at this that we will finish this as shortest job first. So we have P1, which will go until time 11, followed by, now at time 11, they're all there. P5 has also arrived now at time 11, and P5 has the shortest CPU burst. And then we have P4.
and then we have P3. And once you get your Gantt chart correct, it's quite simple to calculate the response time, the wait time, and the turnaround time. So P1 arrived at time zero, uh, first got on the CPU at time zero, so P1's response time is zero. P1 uh, turnaround time, if P1 finished at time 11, uh, because it arrived at time zero, and you can see here that P1 had to wait an additional three time units, so its wait time is going to start zero, uh, zero time units when it first waited, plus the three additional time units it had to wait. Then P2 uh, arrived at time three, got the CPU right away, and never waited, and finished at time six, was, so was active in the system for three time units. P3 arrived at time four, did not get the CPU until time 27, so it it's P4's response time is going to be 23, and turnaround time is 33, and it only waited one time, so it's 23. P4 arrived at time six, first got the CPU at time 18, so P4 is going to have a response time of 12, and a turnaround time finished at 27, arrived at time six, so a turnaround time of 21, and only waited a total of 12 time units. And P5 arrived at time 11, first got the CPU at time 11, did not wait at all, and was active in the system the seven time units of its CPU burst. So that's how you do shortest a remaining time or shortest job first preemptive. Now we're going to do preemptive priority. Now in this case, we, in doing preemptive priority, the highest priority is going to be one. So we need to know that. We need to know that one is the highest priority. And if you have to break a tie, you're going to break the tie based on the, um, the uh, arrival time or first come first serve. And if a lower priority task happens to be on the processor and a higher priority task arrives, it's going to get preempted. So let's see what happens. At time zero, we have P1. And P1 is on the processor. However, if you notice here that P2 is going to arrive at time three, and therefore at time three, P1 is going to be preempted and uh, kicked off the CPU because P2 has a higher priority. So when P2 arrives at time three, it kicks P1 off the CPU. So P1 goes right back into the ready queue at time three and has five time units left of CPU burst. <clears throat> so now the current time is three and the next to go is going to be P2. Okay, so now the current time is three and P2 is going to go on the processor at time three and it has a CPU burst of three. So P2 will be done at time six. So let's just cross that off. So we, all right. So now the current time is six and this is priority based, but uh, P5, which is the only other high priority, which uh, has not arrived yet, so we're going to just have to do first come first serve based on the process that are in the in the ready queue. And so P1 is going to go because P1 went into the ready queue at time 3, P3 went into the ready queue at time 4, and P4 went into the ready queue at time 6. So P1 is going to go first. Now if you notice that P5 is going to arrive at time 8, and P1's CPU burst is going to go past that time of time eight. So at time eight, P1 is once again going to get preempted and have to go back into the ready queue because it is a lower priority. So it's going to go, P1 will go back into the ready queue at time eight and we'll still have three time units of CPU burst left. So now the current time is eight and we have the arrival of this high priority here, P5. So P5 is gonna go, and we can see by looking at this, this 
uh, table here that P5 is the only high priority one left. So P5 is going to finish its entire CPU burst. And until uh, time uh, 15. All right, so now the current time is 15. P5 is done. And we have in the ready queue P1, P3, and P4. And they are all priority twos. So since they're all priority twos, we will just, uh, and none of them are going to preempt each other, we will now use first come, first serve to complete the rest of this Gantt chart. So we have P3, which will go until time 25, followed by P4. And the reason P4 and P3 go before P1 is because although P1 originally got there at time 3, it got preempted again and went back at time 8. So 4 and 6 are before time 8. So we have P4, which uh, will go until time 34. And then we have P1 to finish off and be done at time 37. All right, so once again, we have 100% CP utilization. We just have a different uh, order in which the processes uh, execute. So let's calculate the response time and wait time and turnaround time. So P1 arrived at time zero and first got on the CPU at time zero, so P1's response time is zero. P However, P1 completed all of its execution at time 37, so P1's turnaround time is 37. Now of those 37 time units that P1 was active in the system, only eight of those time units P1 was actually on the CPU, so P1 actually spent 29 time units waiting. It didn't wait in the beginning because it was the only one there, but it did end up uh, spending 29 time units in the ready queue waiting for the CPU. Now P2, P2 arrived at time three, got the CPU right away, never waited at all, and was active in the system for a total of three time units all of that time on the CPU. P3 arrived at time four and eventually got the CPU at time 11, so P3's response time was 11. P3 finished at time uh, 25, and so uh, P3's turnaround time is going to be 21, and if you take a look, it's P3 spent 10 time units on the CPU and 11 time units waiting. Then we have P4, P4 arrived at time six and eventually got the CPU uh, 19 time units later at time 25. And uh, P4 finished at time 34, so it has P4 has a turnaround time of 28 time units. And you can see that 19 of those time units P4 spent waiting and nine of the time units P4 spent on the CPU. And P5 arrived at time eight, never waited, obviously because it's a priority one and this is preemptive priority. And it preempted a, a priority two. And so it only spent seven time units active in the system and all of those time units it spent while on the CPU. So I hope this helps you to understand these uh, algorithms, and in the next video we will practice multi-level queue and multi-level feedback queue.